The audience was the star at Woodstock. You know, and the bands were there because of that. Remember, the original prognostication was that there'd be somewhere between 30 to 50,000 people for the three days, half of whom would spend the three days and the other half of whom would go home each night, and the half that would stay would be sleeping in the campground up there. Well, as you know, that did not come to pass. It was also a chance for our generation to prove that we could be a peaceful generation and live together in peace based, based upon music and love for each other. So it was an experiment. It was originally meant as a local concert that would raise money to build a recording studio in upstate New York. It built way more than anyone could imagine. Hi, I'm Mark Goodman. Fifty years have passed since a live music festival held from August 15th to 18th, 1969 became a defining cultural milestone. Of course, I'm talking about Woodstock. It was a particular alchemy of inspiration, on-the-fly thinking, an evolving business plan, Mother Nature, and of course, the power of music. Those three days in 1969 created a moment, one that still echoes today. Half a century on, we have a slightly different perspective on what was then billed as an Aquarian exposition, three days of peace and music. So let's step back for a moment to explore how one music festival among several that year came to surpass them all and remains the gold standard for every big cultural event to this day. After meeting, Lang and Kornfeld quickly bonded over their mutual love of music. And they started kicking around ideas for something that would capture what was bubbling under in the culture. Lang had been spending a lot of time in an arts community in the Catskills, where artists like Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, and Richie Havens lived. And he had a passion for attending live shows around the country. What intrigued me was Monterey. Um, I was completely taken by that event and that film. And I realized that was something I wanted to do. The Woodstock Festival didn't start out as a festival to begin with. Uh, Michael Lang and Artie Kornfeld had this idea to build a recording studio in the town of Woodstock, New York. Woodstock, New York had been a, a bohemian community, an artist community since the beginning of the 20th century. And a lot of musicians lived there. Bob Dylan, Richie Havens, Van Morrison. Uh, they were all up in Woodstock. But there was no recording studio. Let's build a recording studio. And you know, we can raise money to offset the cost of it by inviting all those local musicians and we can have a party, have a concert. Well, they approached their business partners, uh, Joel, Rosen, uh, Joel Rosenman and John Roberts, uh, and pitched the idea of this recording studio. Well, they'd already built a recording studio in uh, Manhattan. They had no interest at all in doing another recording studio. But they did like this idea of the party, bring all those musicians together, let's do a rock festival. Yeah, well, the first concept was why we said the first night, music and art fair. It was supposed to be the shining light of the War Babies moment. It was supposed to be the moment the War Babies exploded into the world and said, here we are, here's our music and here's our art, and here's how we feel you know, musically and, and politically and in other ways, you know. But music came first, the music part came first. We did recognize that if it did happen, it would have a profound effect on what was happening in the rest of the world. Because all of a sudden the powers that be would say, hey, wait a minute, here's the vote for the future. And they're showing up in mass and they're peaceful.
The seeds were taking root for this combination of an art event, music, and people. But how would it be different? The Woodstock Festival was not the first rock festival. That belongs two years earlier in 1967 with the Monterey Pop Festival, the Magic Mountain uh, Fair, and other festivals in the summer of 1967, the Summer of Love. But after those festivals, rock festivals sprouted up all over the country. Most of them, however, were held at racetracks, parks that had band shells, and of course, many of them uh, had trouble with the law. There were gate crashers, trigger-happy trigger policemen who wanted to see that the, these young people were kept down. Uh, several of the rock festivals that preceded Woodstock ended up in riots. So when Woodstock was announced, and on the uh, lead up to the Woodstock Festival, local law enforcement, in fact, law enforcement all over the state of New York and down into New Jersey were quite worried about what was going to happen in Bethel, New York for that Woodstock Festival. We had a different vision, a completely different vision. And our vision was to create a very positive, a very sort of um, comforting environment for the audience, not to pre present confrontation in any way. To make it something that, you know, if you could imagine the best of what this could be, that's what you're getting. You know, and then you make of it what you will from there. And so I went, I went to Denver and I saw, you know, the, the 250 cops with riot gear sitting in the bleachers right across from people waiting for the, somebody to try and break the gate down. So into our plan went free stage, free kitchens. You know, people are gonna come without money. You don't want, you know, give them a place to go, give them the music, give them the experience, why not? So. That's kind of how um, I developed a lot of the, the strategies for Woodstock. But now they needed a site. This quiet area of upstate New York was not enthusiastic about having a bunch of rock stars and several thousand young people descend on their community. Although the Woodstock team initially struck a deal for a location at Wallkill, it fell through just weeks before the event was to kick off. The pressure was on, but for Lang, there had always been one essential. It was always about going back to nature. It was always about um, organic, you know, because I thought if anything could allow people to feel at ease, that would be it. Enter Max Yasger, one of the area's most prominent citizens, and his 600-acre dairy farm. His son, Sam, looks back. It started as a, as a straight business deal. Uh, the summer of 69 was a very wet summer. We couldn't get hay in the barn. This was a hay field. Uh, when you have that many cattle and you've got to put up enough hay to get them through the winter and you can't make it yourself, the prospect of having to buy that amount of hay was, was uh, daunting, to say the least. Johnny Roberts and Mike Lang came and on, a, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, and said they'd like to rent a field for three days. And this field would be pro appropriate because it has a bowl-shaped topography. Then things changed, and they changed fairly dramatically because some of the neighbors uh, had a very negative reaction to what were then called hippies coming to Western Sullivan County. And that bothered Dad. Um, I can remember him saying to one of them, look, the reason you don't want them here is because you don't like what they look like. You know, I don't particularly like what they look like either, but that's not the point. Uh, they may be protesting the war, but thousands of American soldiers have died so they can do exactly what they're doing. That's what the essence of the country is all about. And from that point on, he became a champion. Word of the festival was spreading, and this was way before social media. Something was in the air. When we started this, we permitted for 50,000. And 50,000 was never really the number. The number that we worked on, that all of my, my projections were made, were 200,000. And that's what we thought we'd max out. And so when we figured toilets, when we figured whatever we figured, we figured something that had to work for a crowd of 200,000 people. And the, the the permit process went on, I think, until three or four days before the event, but, but we knew people were coming from everywhere, because I get calls from California, I get calls from all over the country. You know, and, and most of that was just from rumor, from word of mouth. So we knew that it was gonna be 
immense. We didn't know it was going to be as immense, but we knew it was going to be immense. But there was still something missing, namely the artists. Now, with their connections in the music business and a growing number of advanced tickets already sold, Lang and Kornfeld were able to convince some acts to sign on. Some. In order to get some credibility, we overpaid the first couple of acts. I think we paid $10,000 for Starship on the airplane then, yeah. And, and uh, first two or three acts that we nailed down gave us the credibility for it to start to roll. As long as the advertising kept running and the site kept being built, okay, then I could hold people on a string believing this was going to happen. And then once Jimi Hendrix said yes, then the gates opened. When Jimi said yes, I'll play. And he's the only artist that got like big money for then. You know, everybody else would play for nothing at Woodstock. It didn't matter. In upstate New York, the summer of 69 was one of the wettest on record. After losing their original site in Wallkill, the festival pulled up stakes, literally, and set to work reconstructing the stage and facilities on the Yasger farm. But time and the elements were not cooperating. And so over the weekend that, that we found the site, made the deal with Max, and got the trucks rolling the next day. We were only 23 days out or 24 days out from the festival. And we started moving the crews up, dismantling and reassembling stuff in, in uh, Bethel. I think of the 23 days that we worked up there, the 24 days, whatever it was, it rained probably 20 days. It was unbelievable, the amount of water in the ground, and it's all clay. I remember one piece of road across the top of her, across the top of the hill. I think I put the road in eight times and it sank. And we put the road in and it would sink. And we put the road in and it would rain and it would sink. And every time I'd have to do something like that, because we discover, okay, we, you know, we can't, we can't bury pipe, for example, we couldn't bury the water system. We'd have to run across another piece of Max's land. I'd call up and I'd say, Max, I need to talk to you about something. And I'd always get his wife on the phone and she'd say, okay, come over in half an hour. And Max would have, he had a heart condition, he'd immediately go into the oxygen tent to get ready for my visit. <laughs> As ticket sales increased, it was clear that security would be crucial to manage the crowds on the way to Bethel, New York. But cops in riot gear could easily escalate a situation. The concept, I think, in all our minds from the beginning was to make it just a very safe but very um, embracing environment. You needed cops. We had a security force that was going to be made up of off-duty New York City cops. So. We hired a man named Wes Pomeroy to do our head of security. He was the head of the, the Crime Commission in Washington under Nixon. He handled the 68 um, uh, Democratic Convention in Chicago. He had great experience in dealing with crowds and the right attitude. You know, you don't want someone who's going to be a macho guy just, you know, creating the, those, those, those uh, irritations. And Wes understood it all. And somewhere there is a questionnaire form that, that uh, he used to interview the, the off-duty cops with, which is just riotous, but it was designed to, to find out what do you do when somebody blows pot smoke in your face. The hog farm was originally tasked with setting up services like a kitchen, medical tents, and trip tents to help anybody under the influence. But after the police were pulled, the farm had one more thing added to their list. Hugh Romney, better known as Wavy Gravy, and Lisa Law were commune members. The hog farm commune were a bunch of misfits, all living together, helping each other out. And the hog farm is known for their caring for people that are loaded. And that's why, actually, they were hired. They were hired in order to help take care of any drug problems that were going to arise, which did, because almost everybody at Woodstock was loaded. We spilled off that aircraft, and there was the world press standing around, Klieg lights blazing, cameras at the hip and ready, and this reporter looks at me and says, oh, the hog farm, huh? You guys are the security, I said. My God, they made us the cops. <laughs> I said, 
Well, do you feel secure? The guy said, well, well sure. I said, see, it's working. Feeding people would be another factor. The hog farm was setting up kitchens on the site. Lisa Law went to see the investors, Joel Rosenman and John Roberts. So I went to the office there, and uh, Joel and John were there, and I said, I need another $3,000. And they said, well, what for? And I said, well, so far I've got half of what I need, and I need some more money to get the rest of it because we're going to be feeding a lot of people. So I bought 1,500 pounds of bulgur wheat and 1,500 pounds of rolled oats, too, and currants, things for muesli. We got trash cans to mix our vegetables in, cleavers, Chinese cleavers, onion cutters, and everything to mix the food in. And that's what we ended up mixing the muesli in, was these big trash cans. We had to think big. The Woodstock planters had originally thought they might get 50,000 people. But a few days out, with things nowhere near being done, people were continuing to arrive, and those numbers well exceeded the promoter's estimate. And that summer, John Conway was a teenager working at a local gas station. We had these people coming in in, um, in these Volkswagen vans, and you know, a lot of them didn't have any money. They had come from pretty far away and they were desperate for gas. They you know, literally were begging you, could, could we drain the hoses into the, the Volkswagen so that we can get a little bit further on? And, uh, um, and at first I was not aware of what was going on. In fact, I remember people coming in and asking for directions to Woodstock, not knowing anything about this Woodstock concert at this early point in the summer. We were literally directing people to Woodstock in Ulster County, and then uh, at some point in time we realized that um, there was this music festival that was supposed to be happening. But these people came very early for the festival and they didn't have tickets. And that's another thing that I think a lot of people forget is that there were really two groups of people who came to the concert. There were a group that had tickets who arrived late for the most part and, and found this amazing uh, group of people already there who had come early because they didn't have tickets and had created this uh, site around the, the festival. So it was pretty interesting in that regard to see this influx into the county and, and it was a different kind of person than we were used to seeing. So I walk out and it's like the day before the festival and it, you know nobody's even tried to put up fences and uh, there's 75,000 people on the field you know I said what are we gonna do ask him to leave? But on either Wednesday or Thursday morning there were already a few thousand kids sitting on this site and the way it was related to me is that particularly Johnny Roberts became concerned. The thing that he did not want was a crush against the fence and anybody getting hurt. So he ordered the fence taken down and Woodstock then became a freebie. And when Woodstock became a freebie, uh, one of the most popular DJs of the day who, who happened to have a house up here in the county, a fellow by the name of Bruce Morrow, cousin Brucey, announced on the radio that Woodstock was a freebie and New York City emptied out. I mean, I was a little nervous. The angels came rolling in the morning, Friday morning, and, and uh, the sky didn't look, you know, too friendly. And, but as soon as the music finally started, as soon as we got the music going, you could feel where the people were coming from and what the crowd was feeling. You could actually feel it. It was palpable. You know, I knew we were okay. By the first official day of the festival, about 400,000 people gathered in Maxi Asker's field. More were coming. There were rumors that some of the biggest groups might appear. They didn't show. John Lennon, stuck in Canada. Dylan didn't like crowds. Jim Morrison hated playing outdoor festivals. And Mick Jagger was filming the movie Ned Kelly. But in the meantime, 32 other acts were making their way to Woodstock, or at least trying to. Weather, time, and other issues had slowed preparations, and the delays would affect performances throughout the entire weekend. 
Around 5 o'clock, an anxious Woodstock team enlisted Richie Havens to start the show. So here we are at the two hotels they told us to come to, seven miles away from the, uh, the ground. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at television, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at television, and saying hi to somebody. It's now 3.30 in the, in the afternoon, and going, uh-oh, something's wrong, because no one's come to say anything, you know, what is happening. And the next thing I know, I hear this really loud noise. Turns out that they found a farmer down the road with a helicopter. So we crammed into this helicopter, two, two conga drums in between me and the guy on this side and, and the other guy sitting a little below us, you know. And um, we made it to the back of that stage and got off the helicopter and started to walk around backstage. And the only person I saw was Tim Harden, the only person. And I went, hey, Tim is here. Tim, did you go on? No, I'm not going on first. I say, wow. I know I'm supposed to be fifth, so that's what I expected. And of course, an hour later, they started chasing me because I was running. <laughs> Every time they'd say, Richie, would you go on? Something's got to happen. I'd say, yeah, you want it to happen to me, right? <laughs> During the course of the day, Friday, um, waiting for Richie Havens, you know, and the, and the delay and the delay and the delay or whatever, and then, you know, looking at what was happening around you. Um, and then when he finally started to play and hearing the, just the, the roar, you know, that came out of the area, you know, at that point, you kind of knew that it was something, something different. Logistics were making it tough for other performers to make it to the site. I was supposed to do maybe 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. And when I walked off the first time, they said, Richie, you gotta do four more songs. So I said, okay. I went back and I did four more songs and I walked off again and said, Richie, three more? You know. On the sixth time that I walked back, for real, <laughs> they said, just one more. Somebody's on the way. <laughs> they couldn't get anybody there. So I went out of the stage and and you, you, you see me kind of stalling because that's exactly what I was doing. That long intro to what is freedom, the song, was me trying to figure out what to sing. I sang every song I knew. Yeah, I was 22 years old. I mean, I look back at other people who were 22 years old and they look like little kids or something. And basically scared the hell out of me. On the other hand, once I got off the stage, I also knew that there was no gig that could ever frighten me because I had just done this one. Because there was people, like I said, not just the people in the field. When we were up in that helicopter, there was people as far as the eye could see in every direction, 360 degrees. It was only a small portion of them that was actually in the field itself. And it was just sort of like a convergence of, of stuff that was going on. Creedence Clearwater Revival had been among the first to sign a deal to perform, but the delays pushed their start time to three in the morning on Saturday the 16th. By Saturday, the only way for artists to get in and out of the festival was by helicopter. Some didn't make it, others did. One of the bands that didn't show up at Woodstock was Iron Butterfly. They were stuck at LaGuardia Airport. They asked for a helicopter to get them to the festival. And by that time, with all the traffic problems and all the other headaches, the Woodstock promoters just didn't have the inclination or the time to honor their request. The Woodstock promoters sent a telegram, the Iron Butterfly's manager. The first letter of each line of that telegram spelled out their response to the request for a helicopter. 
I'll let you fill in the blanks, but it started with F and ended with U. One of the glaring omissions at the Woodstock Festival was Joni Mitchell. She wasn't even asked to perform at the festival. She had wanted to attend to support her fellow musicians like Crosby, Stills, Nash, John Sebastian, others. But her agent said, no, you can't go to the festival. You're scheduled to be on the Dick Cavett Show. It's an important show. We can't afford to have you miss that if you're stuck in traffic or if you can't get out of the festival in time. Joni Mitchell wasn't at Woodstock, but she did get the last laugh. She wrote that famous song, Woodstock, and even though she wasn't at the festival, even though she wrote that song from a hotel room in New York City, watching the festival on television, more than anyone, she captured the spirit of the Woodstock Festival in that song. The weather wreaked havoc with the schedule. Michael Lang had to rethink the entire lineup. It was determined organically. We needed acoustic. <laughs> it was wet. It was rain. We didn't want anybody to fry. So it was a question of who's here, who's ready to go on, and who's acoustic. And during the dry segments, it was also who's gotten in, because, you know, the roads were a mess. And it was as the bands would arrive and as we'd have their equipment assembled, it was kind of, you know, who's going to be ready to go. And it really happened that way. I mean, Richie played, you know, for probably almost two hours because I wouldn't let him off the stage. We had nobody to follow him. You know, he kept shipping him back out and he kept making up songs. And, and that's really how, how I ran the stage. I mean, it was that, it was of necessity. It was who we got and when can we get him on. I wasn't on the poster. Nobody intended for me to play. Uh, I was there strictly because this was the most happening thing that had, you know, gone on and I wanted to be there and see it. I wanted to be a spectator. But because all my friends were backstage, I practically walked from the helicopter to the backstage, so people began to go, oh great, when are you playing? And I, I'm not playing, I don't even have a guitar. Well, it just so happened that my old pal Timmy Harden did have a guitar and was there. So it was somewhere in the second day, somebody hadn't showed up yet, and it had started to rain. So I, I, I get summoned into the uh, sort of war room there in the center of uh, the backstage area. And Chip Monk, the voice of Woodstock that we all remember describing how the purple acid is not particularly good, uh, asked me, look, it's raining. We're having trouble with the sound system. We're afraid to put an amplifier on the stage. We're figuring we could keep this audience's attention if we had a guy with one guitar who could hold them. You're elected. So I go to Timmy and I say, Timmy, I need a guitar. He lends me a Harmony Sovereign. This is the great workhorse guitar uh, for people buying instruments for under $60. So with that instrument and a slight buzz, I went on in the rain and uh, uh, as it happened, uh, the rain had stopped by the time I finished. Generally when you get on a stage, well, you never know nowadays, but before that, you get on a stage, even in Monterey, you, you look down and, you know, your peripheral vision took in the entire audience. That was impossible at Woodstock. You had to turn your head to see the whole audience. It was literally an ocean of people. I had never seen anything. And, and the stage was huge, humongous. Some of the more incendiary performances on day two came from Janis Joplin, The Who, Santana, and Sly Stone. So when he sang, I want to take you higher, and then I think Chip Monk threw the lights up and down and everybody was singing back, and we got caught in the middle of the vibe of a half a million people in Sly. And just to be in the middle, I mean, I mean, I believe in these things. There is energy and it travels. To be in the middle of that energy was mind blowing. I would say that was the highest point, you know, to me of the, of the festival as far as really enjoying it.
Grace Slick, the most vivid spark that comes out of a, a lot of, of hazy, you know, events that, that occurred during the course of that weekend. Waking up to Grace Slick screaming out time for morning maniac music and then going into to volunteers you know and crawling out of the tent and sliding my way down through the mud or whatever to to get a better view of what was happening you know when i think about it that was like what are the focal points one band that probably owes its career to woodstock is santana santana was a young band of really talented musicians in the san francisco bay area that were very well known on the west coast but had not released their first album yet it was in the can ready to be released when they appeared on the stage at woodstock and santana exploded on the stage drummer michael shreve banged on those drums and created an impression that's widely recognized as probably one of the best drum solos in rock history Santana's shining moment at Woodstock was Soul Sacrifice. It was towards the end of their set. Carlos Santana was very high on mescaline or LSD at the time, and he was having a hard time keeping it together. He's been on record as saying that the guitar neck was turning into a serpent, and he was struggling to keep it in his hand and play all the right notes. Everybody was playing at their best. Soul Sacrifice became an anthem for Woodstock. The Who was at the top of their game when they hit Woodstock. Tommy had been released earlier in the year, a month before they had started performing it uh, publicly. And so when they hit the stage at Woodstock, they played a couple of their old songs and then launched right into Tommy. And they did the entire rock opera for an audience that was probably very familiar with the, the, the material. And just as Roger Daltrey is singing See Me, Feel Me at the end of the rock opera, the sun is coming up. Performers on day three included Joe Cocker, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and Country Joe and the Fish. It hadn't been planned, but the need to constantly shift the lineup was a bonus. But, uh, that was a surprise. Um, no, just the way the first day was basically folk music. The second day was acts that were really good. And, you know, and the third day was like one after the other of killer acts. So it built up. I think if the killer acts would open the first day, it could have been Bedlam. Because people might have started, you know, the mosh pit might have been invented 40 years earlier, you know? While Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young had recently formed, Neil Young hadn't planned on appearing. I don't remember at what point he actually walked on stage, but I remember he walked on, you know, but he wasn't supposed to be there. He just showed up. And uh, that was, uh, that's the one, it's a secret, guys. I'm letting a secret out, and it's been let out. The fact that they were the only act, because they were on Warner Brothers, that overdubbed in the Woodstock movie. They actually went in the studio. That's not them live at Woodstock on the record. Although the song, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, is one of the classics of all time, you know, and uh, they were blown away because I knew David too, you know, so they were just blown away. They were shocked. David even said, he says, I'm scared shitless. He said, this is our second gig, man. That's just what he said, you know, and they were scared. Because of the delays, what began as a three-day festival spilled over into part of a fourth day. One of the uh, quirkier moments, Sha Na Na. You gotta ask yourself, how in the world did Sha Na Na end up at Woodstock? Especially sandwiched right in front of Jimi Hendrix, the opening act for Jimi Hendrix, if you will. Sha Na Na, for those of you who don't know who Sha Na Na was, they had a very popular syndicated TV show in the 70s and 80s, but they were caricatures. They were doing 50s music, and it was a shtick for them. Uh, and they knew it. These guys were intelligent guys. They were all Columbia students. And how in the world did they get booked at Woodstock? I don't have a clue. Except maybe Michael Lang was down in the village some night, and somebody said, you got to see this group. And he saw them and said, sure. You want to come to Woodstock, but to put them in the bill, the second to last act of the entire festival, right before Jimi Hendrix, um, I would think that the brown acid would have been doing its work about then. 
And then one of the most iconic moments of Woodstock, Jimi Hendrix. Quite honestly, I was disappointed. You know, when he first came, came with his manager, Michael Jeffries, and he came on Saturday, Sunday, Sunday morning. And I had a house in the back of the stage up on a hill across the road for him. And uh, I said, look, and part of the deal was he closes the show. And I, again, made my my wife. I said, it's not going to be the best spot for you. <laughs> you really ought to think about doing something, you know, at midnight, you know, it'll be, you know, the high point of the night, blah, blah, blah. No, we're closing the show. Because in those days, and I guess it's still true today, whoever closes is the king. You know, that's the big act. It's changed somewhat. People started to realize that, you know, there are spots in the show where you don't have to, which are better, you know, in any case. But they insisted, so he went up on, onto the hill. And I was disappointed about the size of the crowd. He also had put together a band, a band of gypsies, which was kind of a pickup band, guys from Woodstock, good players, you know, Ron, Juma, kind of player, good, good players, but not a great moment in his musical career. So the set I thought was kind of mediocre, and, and you know, there were maybe 30, 40,000 people left, and I felt it was a little sad to see that, you know, and the lights were gone, and it was sort of the starkness of the day. And then he did this Star Spangled Banner, it just, you know, changed everything. <laughs> It was it. It was just one of those moments that said it all for us, you know. Woodstock was now over, leaving behind a major imprint on Max Yasker's farmland, not to mention the culture. After those three plus days, we had crossed into something else. Things would never be the same, ever. What also made Woodstock successful was its legacy. The promoters brought in a film crew that documented every bit of the Woodstock Festival. And that documentary won the 1970 Best Picture, Best Documentary Award at the Academy Awards that year. Uh, the soundtrack album, a triple album, made the music of Woodstock famous worldwide. And the musicians that played on that album became the soundtrack of our youth. It really was three days of peace in music. One of the lasting impacts of Woodstock is on the music industry itself. The music industry uh, at Woodstock realized that there is a large, large audience for this music and that there's a large audience not just for the recorded music but also for the performances. Of course the Beatles had played Shea Stadium, Candlestick Park, a lot of other large venues, but they had the house PA, they didn't have great sound systems, and uh, at Woodstock, there was a custom-made sound system for this venue. Uh, and there was attention paid to having great sound over a large area uh, for a, a large crowd. That was the moment that made all of their careers, all of their careers. That was the Crosby, Stills & Nash's first gig. Could you imagine? I mean, they made the record, it was on the radio, and they get to sing, you know, more than a quarter of a, or a half a million people, more. In three days, Woodstock, the Isle of Wight in England, and Blind Faith as a band in the park over there, was over a million and three quarters of people in three events. Can't change that. We're now looking to have that event over and over and over, and we have it. It's here, it's in every venue, you know, around that's open to hear what people want to do. 
And, and so to me, that's, that's a good part. But what really sent a ripple out into the ether was something less tangible. It certainly was mythological in its, in its impact on the people that were there. I don't think you can exaggerate that. You could feel the, the, the unity and, and the, the togetherness of that crowd. You can cut it with a knife. I mean, you could feel it. People who were passing through it could feel it. People on the throughway could feel it. It wasn't like some mysterious space dust. It was a real vibe that, you know, that couldn't be denied. I don't know. I don't know, is the honest answer there. Um, I, I certainly felt part of the event, a kind of a humanism that was part of the hippie ethos that had a power. And I guess it did give you the illusion of infinite possibilities. You know, hippie's never gonna be a bad word to me. I don't care how out of fashion the uh, various lifestyle, you know. I may not have my tie-dyed uh, uh, Levi jacket on, but it's on inside. But this rock and roll thing, man, this is like, <laughs> and it's, I don't know, it's still going on. It's still going on and it's n music, global music is never gonna be the same and we, we did it. We did it as a generation, as a collection of people. From, from the audience, to the sound mixers, to the camera people, to those goofball promoters who got this crazy idea, to the venture capitalists, to the great guy who's cleaning the toilet, who's got a kid in the audience and a kid in Vietnam. We just kicked their fucking ass. What made Woodstock, I think, was just a a right, right time, just a blending of a lot of different things that all came together, you know, very much by accident, I think. You know, it was just a, uh, boy, very hard one to word. Uh, enough people angry about what was happening in the world, enough people thinking that the potential was there to change the world. Um, you know, there was a lot of hope that went on at that stage of the game. Uh, you know, it wasn't just a matter of uh, let's go over and get wasted or whatever. It was a matter of, of let's try to do something. Perhaps the most immediate legacy of Woodstock was felt just a few months later. On November 15th, 1969, half a million people gathered in Washington, D.C. to protest the Vietnam War. I was one of them. The collective power felt at Woodstock no doubt had an impact on the moratorium. After those three days in 1969, that same spirit would find its way into other festivals. One of the biggest, Live Aid in 1985. I was there too. Two major concerts, one held in Philadelphia at JFK Stadium, the other at London's Wembley Arena, raised $127 million to fight the severe famine in Ethiopia. Like Woodstock, Live Aid featured some of the biggest music acts in the world. U2, Queen, Madonna, Paul McCartney. 16 years after playing Woodstock, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young reunited for the show. So did The Who. There would be other big music events like Coachella, Bonnaroo, Glastonbury, Lollapalooza. And there were two more runs at Woodstock, 94 and 99. 94 was great. 94 had a real warm feeling. It was kind of a nice bridge between, you know, the older generation and we had a lot of parents came with their kids and we had a lot of yaks from from the 69 era as well as newer acts. 99 was much edgier, much too edgy actually as it turned out. And you wind up with, you know, you wind up having to make compromises because of, of corporate involvement. You know, I'm never one who had a problem with art and commerce. I always thought there was a way. But you pay a price for it. So I think that, that the purity of, of what we did in 1969 was unique.
One of the more recent echoes of Woodstock occurred when the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, mobilized after a mass shooting at their school in February of 2018. Just a month later, these high school students organized the global March for Our Lives protests, advocating for stricter gun control laws. On a single day, 800 simultaneous protests took place around the world. 1.2 million people joined in, making it one of the biggest youth protest events since Vietnam. Arlo Guthrie recalls the same kind of determined thinking from the Woodstock era kids. Most people I knew just wanted to hang out, go to school, you know, have, meet your girlfriend, eat a pizza, drive around somewhere, look at a sunset or whatever, you know, play some music, have a good time. Well, that was, that was true for everybody. So we knew where the, we were, we thought we were normal. And they were telling us that we were nuts, that we were criminals, that we were acting in a way that was uh, contributing to the uh, demise of civilization. And we knew that they were nuts, that their way of doing things had got us to this point. And we thought, you know, we got to do something different. So everybody started doing things a little different. And so there was a whole lot of young people all over the world who said, enough of that. We can always get back to it, but we got to try something different here. Maybe a little love and peace. Maybe a little getting along. Maybe a little get away from the fear and uh, all of that kind of stuff would help. And so we actually started doing it. And these were brave kids who would stand out there with flowers in their hands, giving them to uh, soldiers with loaded guns. So these were not just some wimpy kids with nothing else to do. These were people who were willing to face even death at some point because they knew that what they were thinking about, what was in their heart, was at least a better alternative to the way things had been going. At a time when people begin to realize that they do have the wherewithal, they do have the inner strength to do those kinds of things. And so that will be the next revolution that we, I predict, will see, is that there'll be hundreds of thousands and then millions of people, young people, who decide on their own, not to wait to see what the president says or who he or she is, not to wait to see what the Congress has to say, just in your own heart, you know something's right, you go ahead and you do it. I think the lasting legacy is people being heard. And uh, either that's through the music that they express, the causes that they support, or what they speak to power to communicate. And the lasting legacy has to be standing up for right. Woodstock isn't just about those three days in 1969. Woodstock is a feeling that lives today, and it lives in a lot of people's hearts. We hope that young people will look at the legacy of the 1960s, the legacy of the Woodstock Festival, and ask themselves, what do I want from the world today, and how will I get that? It's been 50 years since four young entrepreneurs took their idea for a local festival at an obscure New York art colony and turned it into a defining moment of the 20th century. Clothes may have changed, the music too. Wars have stopped and sadly started again. But for those who were there and for those who weren't, Woodstock's impact has not dimmed. It's felt in every impulse to create change to disrupt the status quo, to evolve both culturally and personally. To paraphrase Joni Mitchell in her famous anthem about the event, life is for learning. A half a century later, the lessons of Woodstock are still being revealed. I'm Mark Goodman. Thanks for watching. <laughs>